Bene. Una volta che si capisce quello che si sta dicendo, 
dovremmo come ricercatori e studiosi provare l'irresistibile pulsione o di immediatamente confutare il testo girato o di immediatamente adottarlo. E questa è un'urgenza anche per ciò che ci vediamo intorno dai primi testi che Girard ha scritto dagli anni 60, nel suo Tour de Force, delle cose nascoste sin dalla fondazione del mondo, scritto nel 1978, Girard dice qualcosa del genere, dice quello che stiamo dicendo qui in quel libro nel 78 e che può ora sembrarci strano, incomprensibile o anche paradossale, contraddittorio, molto rapidamente diventerà quasi di senso comune, sarà in un certo senso sulla bocca di tutti. E forse questa profezia si avverrà più rapidamente di quello che il stesso Gerard eh, pensava. E non vi sorprende dunque che la mia figlia è una, sostanzialmente una girardiana epistemica, anche se non è del tutto una girardiana deontologica. Spero, non, spero che non sia solo per l'urgia medica del suo padre. Ora, ultima considerazione che voglio fare che potrebbe esserci rivolta una domanda in questo momento. Perché lo facciamo qui? Perché nel nostro Dipartimento di Ingegneria Civile, Ambientale e di Architettura, in un Dipartimento che si occupa non di filosofia in senso preciso, in senso stretto, ma dello spazio, del territorio e del suo progetto. Ora sarà un caso di quello che in psicanalisi si chiama la sovradeterminazione, ma potrei darvi tre e non una sola risposta a questa domanda. La prima è che non siamo solo architetti o urbanisti o quelli che si occupano del territorio. Questo è un colloquio interdottorato e siamo molto lieti di avere tra noi coinvolto otto dipartimenti e sei dottorati, quasi tutti i dottorati delle scienze sociali che in questo percorso di dieci giorni ci seguono, organizzano seminari, discutono con i dottorandi e soprattutto straordinari opportunitati per interagire con eh, Dumouche. La seconda risposta perché lo facciamo qui e perché no? La rilevanza di Girard trascende campi e steccati disciplinari ed è non solo rilevante ma è anche una chiave che consente di offrirci il Dumouchel ha scritto questo saggio e eh, questa è una teoria di tutto e ha una risposta molto originale a questo però ci avviciniamo a una ipotesi che è scientifica in senso autentico del tempo che ha la capacità di farci vedere anche qualche nesso che unifica. La terza risposta invece, perché lo facciamo qui, è che c'è qui roba anche per noi in senso stretto. Il presupposto alla base di questo colloquio è che, pensiamo, Girard possa essere rilevante anche per lo spazio e per il suo progetto, che molti fenomeni spaziali potranno essere interpretati in maniera più efficiente, quasi come se fosse un rasoio di Occam, se solo nella loro dinamica siamo in grado di dire, quasi inserire il motore girardiano. E chi di noi si occupa di architettura, della città o del territorio potrà avere l'opportunità di esplorare con noi questa ipotesi in questi dieci giorni. E per farlo abbiamo lo straordinario onore e il privilegio di avere con noi Cagliari, Paul Dumouchel come professore di università. L'onore e il privilegio non è solo perché Dumouchel è uno dei più profondi conoscitori del pensiero di Girard, collega con cui ha anche scritto molte cose. Si tratta di un filosofo di primissimo piano, con lavori, libri che sono ampiamente letti, studiati e tradotti in molte lingue. Dumouchel è stato da prima all'Università di Quebec a Montreal, Università di Quebec a Montreal, è stato presidente per anni dell'Associazione Filosofica Canadese e negli ultimi 15 anni è professore di filosofia della Università Rizzumeicana di Kyoto presso la Graduate School of Coretics and Frontier Sciences. Oltre a guidarci in questa esplorazione per due settimane avremo modo di conoscere meglio alcune sue riflessioni e lavori, in particolare sull'ambivalenza della scarsità e la sua istituzione sociale che a mio avviso è una straordinaria riflessione filosofica e sociologica sulla transizione della nostra società dalle forme tradizionali di solidarietà alle forme moderne e contemporanee. Sentiremo poi la sua tesi sulla violenza politica, 
non vi dico altro, se non che basta guardarci intorno per renderci conto quanto questo tema sia attuale, oltre allo stesso tempo a essere un tema eterno. Infine, l'ultimo giorno, presenteremo il 10 maggio il suo ultimo libro scritto con Luisa Damiano, Vivere con i robot, un saggio sull'empatia artificiale e la filosofia della mente. E con questo evento siamo stati fortunati tre volte. Il libro in inglese è del 2017, Living with Robots, ma è appena stato pubblicato in Italia da uh, Raffaele Cortina. Quando dico appena, intendo letteralmente appena, lo scorso 18 aprile, e quindi abbiamo la straordinaria opportunità di avere la presentazione di questo libro qua da noi a Cagliari. La seconda fortuna è che il 10 maggio la coautrice, Luisa Damiano, era disponibile a raggiungerci e quindi avremo con noi anche Luisa per quella che sarà appunto la prima nazionale con entrambi gli autori e forse l'ultima <ride> i eh, libri si presentano quando sono a Cagliari. La terza fortuna è che abbiamo trovato anche degli scassi di grande valore ne discuterà nel libro il 10 maggio con l'autrice e l'autore, i nostri colleghi, Arnaldo Cecchini, Elisabetta Gola, forse è qui, forse ci raggiungerà. E con questo, eh, prima di darvi un Paul de Muschel, vi dico solo questo. Ah, abbiamo distribuito, Paul de Muschel presenterà la sua prima relazione introduttiva sul pensiero di René Girard e teoria mimetica. Abbiamo distribuito un po' di per un piccolo testo che non presenterà ma che avete in versione inglese forse il numero non è adeguato chi ha difficoltà a conseguire meglio in inglese sia, uh, si faccia avanti e chieda al suo collega che magari capisce meglio l'inglese di farselo prestare, farselo dare per poter seguire meglio e con questo Paul Duchel Something a little bit paradoxical there because 
what it says is that the unity of the theory comes from its end. And a few years later, uh, Lucien Scubla, who is also a very good reader of René Girard, a very serious, wrote something completely different. He said that there is not one theory in Girard, but there are three. There's a theory of desire. There is a theory of the origin of culture and of institutions. And there is an interpretation of Christianity. And according to Scubla, all three areas are independent in what philosophers call logically detachable, which means whether one theory is right, true, or false has no incidence on whether the other theory is true or false. So the theory of desire can be false, but the theory of the origin of culture could be true. Or the, th the interpretation of Christianity can be true, but the other two theories is false. So then this was, so the question which arises, what is the level of unity of this theory, right? How strongly united it is? Well, if you ask René himself, he would be more to the direction of Jean-Pierre Dupuis. But at the same time, we should not dismiss what Scubla says, because the theory, because what Girard wrote is, main books, and actually I will present the three main ideas of running to three books, which are, the, which are separated for the first two one by 11 years, and by the second and the third one, six years. So when Girard wrote his first book, he didn't know what he was going to write 11 years later in his second book. And when he wrote his second book, he probably had very little idea of what we would write in the third book. So to say that, that the unity comes from the third book has a little something a little bit paradoxical, or rather, even though it is, of course, plausible, it is also very certain that many things which are included in the first book do not find their way into the third book. So, as I said, we can, I, can, I will present this through three books, and the ideas will be, um, which are presented in each book, will be actually um, taken over or treated over and over again so that even though they were first like they were first presented by the end it, is, it will be different. So the first book is Mensonge Romantique in Vérité Romanesque. And I will present the idea of mimetic or triangular desire related to Mensonge Romantique in Vérité Romanesque. The second book is Violence of the Sacred and I will present the idea of the origin of culture in violence of sacred, the actually one of the central area of the, the uh, idea of the theory. And the third book is Things Hidden Since the Foundations of the World, and Things Hidden contains the interpretation of Christianity, which will be, which is viewed by many as the culmination of the theory of self. So, before coming to the first book, I want to make a methodological um, remark. Mensonge Romantique et Vérité Romanesque is a strange book in, uh, I was going to say in many ways, but it is originally an essay on the novel, and it was received by such, as such, not as something which had, a general, which had necessarily consequences which went beyond a literary essay on the novel. And this essay will propose a theory concerning the cognitive or epistemic nature of literature. In other words, the idea that literature itself contains a certain knowledge about the world. And in fact, more precisely, it claims that the novel knows more about the world than the theories which we usually use to interpret the novel. In other words, that the novel has a knowledge of the world, which is superior in a sense than psychoanalytic theory, which we use to interpret novel, or than Marxism that we use to interpret novel. This is the claim. So the claim is that, this is a very, methodologically a very important claim, because it is the claim that cultural <coughs> objects, right, have a certain knowledge about the culture, which many times is more interesting or more revealing about how the world is made than the theories which we tend to, 
we have constructed and we tend to use to explain these cultural objects. And this idea, which is present in his first book, will be present in Girard. In the second book, in uh, Violence and the Sacred, and also in his reading of Christianity. The idea that actually if you want to understand how violence was dealt with in the ancient world, you need to look at the ancient text rather than to look directly at theories about what, how this works. So, the first book, Vincent Romantique and Vérité Romanes. Um, so it is mensonge and vérité, lie and truth. And this is an important point in Girard, that there is this idea that novels both reveal the truth and they lie, or they hide things. So there is this ambiguity which is always present, right? And when he presents his first idea, the, the idea of mimetic, which will come to be called mimetic the eye, desire, in Violet, in Mansos um, Romantic in Vérité Romanesque, he names it triangular desire. And the idea of triangular desire is the idea that desire is not a straight line which relates a subject to an object. But rather that it is, it should be seen as having a structure or could be represented as a triangular structure or to use a different language. Desire is not a dyadic relationship, it's a triadic relationship. And you have a subject, an object, and another person, which he defines as the mediator or the model. And the main, the, the central idea is that our desires are always mediated. We desire objects because others desire them. And if they are not desired by others, we don't desire them. So, of course, this, will, this raises interesting question, right? So, just to insist on this, instead of having two opposite poles, the desire always has, like a triangle, three poles. The subject, the object, and the mediator of model. The summit of the triangle is the mediator, whose influence intends, it extends both to the subject and to the object. Now there is an evident objection to this idea that desire is always the imitation of another's desire. And this objection is very simple. Whose desire is the many ages desire, the imitation of? <laughs> right? In other words, the problem is that it tends to lead to a kind of infinite regression, right? Shouldn't there be an original desire which is desired, which is imitated by somebody else? So actually, the answer to this fundamental question will only come in things hidden since the foundations of the world. In a sense, before that, Girard just doesn't really pay much attention to it. There is a, temp a temporary answer, which is to say, well, who does the mediator imitate? Well, he imitates the model. And then that would work very well. But actually, if you think about it a little bit, in this explanation, what is involved is actually something like a, a slip between two different meanings of the term desire. I mean, there is the desire of the model which imitates the mediator, but the indication of the mediator that he desires something may perhaps not yet qualify for the name desire, as it will be used later on. And in the initial sketch, this is probably exactly the solution that Girard will provide. So, why do we imitate the desire of others? Girard offers actually two different answers to this, which may be seen as quite different. First, we imitate the desire of others because we do not know what we need or what we want or what we desire. We do not 
know what is good for us and and we look unto others to provide the answer to that. I mean, that is a very evident um, situation when you think of children. Children learn what is good for them and learn the desire to their parents, to older, to agents, to their schoolmates. That is, that is a very evident behavior that happens. The other reason... Does everybody hear it? Yeah. The sound fine. Yeah. The other reason is because some others appear to us as being, Girard says, endowed with a plenitude of being which we don't have. They appear to us as being happy, as being able to do it, deal with things the way we cannot, as Just being better, in a sense. And therefore, we tend to view what they desire as being not necessarily the mean to do that, but actually as part of being like that. So, imitating the desire of the other is, in a sense, imitating the other and trying to be the other in a certain way. Dalziar argues that this process is mostly unconscious. Not in the Freudian sense, but in the sense of we're not aware of it most of the time. We don't realize that we do things because others indicate them to us. And he thinks that novelists can be, or he argues in our social romantic and very humanist, that novelists can be, in a sense, divided, separated, distinguished from each other because some novels reflect the desire the mythic dimension of others, of desire, and some novels reveal it. In other words, they play a different role, and this sends back to the question before of lying and the truth. Now, imitation is at the center of this process of desire. The subject imitates the desire of the model, and from this imitation, from this imitated or mimetic desire, there derive some very important types of phenomena, which I think are really important to indicate if we want to understand what's going on. <clears throat> the first one is rivalry. Identify the type of structures which lead to more conflict and the type of structures which lead to less conflict. That is why this, the, the transformation from an explanation in terms of cause to explanation of failure structure is a very important one because it tells us or it suggests how we should deal with a certain number of problems in a very different way. And for me one of the interests of Girard's explanation of conflict is precisely that it is structural rather than being causal. Also we will see later on that the, the insist, to insist or to put the emphasis on the cause of the conflict tends to be to send back not only to the rivalry between the two agents which are involved, but also to the sacrificial dimension of the violence which we talked about. So the second point, from the imitation of desire will proceed behaviors which do not look like imitation at all. And that I think is, the most, is a very important point. When we say that people imitate each other, we tend to, see, to think that they dress the same way. They like the same music. They become, therefore, the same. But the idea of imitation of desire leads to behaviors which, though imitative in a, in a way, because they're the imitation of behavior, at first sight, do not look at all like imitation. Because who is the person you want to resemble less? Well, your enemy, your rival. You don't want to be like him, you want, or her, or whatever. You want to be different. But why do you want to be different? If your rivalry sends back to the fact that you're looking, you're desiring the same object. So, and another thing is, the more you get into conflict with people, and this leads to what René called negative imitation, the person 
you don't want to be like your enemy is somebody you want to be completely like. So if he likes, likes this, you will like something else. If he desires pasta, you'll desire meat or whatever. But the idea is simply that. But at first sight then, this doesn't look like, like imitation. So there is a necessity to figure out or to discover what is the type of, or what is the level at which the imitation acts. Otherwise you will not see it, right? Um, It, therefore, it is not always evident that the agents are imitating each other. In fact, according to Girard, the more they are involved, the rivalry between agents becomes intense, and the more they will try to show themselves different from each other. They will all the more be scramped, strongly claim their difference, that they are more alike. So that a central claim of those engaged in such rivalry will be that they are different, that they certainly do not imitate each other and that there is a difference and that this difference is what is most important. So this is also included in, in Remy's idea which is that we should not take at face value agents claim that their difference is the most important thing. The difference is often a relates to actually their complex which comes back to a certain identity or mimicry. Mimetic theory is a priori suspicious of the claim to absolute difference between us and others. That's certainly one of its central ideas. And it says that methodologically, humanly and ethically, we should pay more attention to what is similar between agents than to what is different between people in relation. A few things follow from this second point. One is that, as mentioned before, the imitative aspect of behavior involved is not evident at first sight. The signs of the imitation of desire may, uh, will usually be more abstract than the mere description of the surface behavior of agents. To recognize them, we need to pay attention to both agents over time and to the fact that the asymmetry which exists at one point in time will often be reversed at a later time. Closely related to this is the idea of negative model. In fact, if you, take, you want to take a, uh, a recent example, Barack Obama seems to be the negative model of Donald Trump. In the sense that Trump, since he has been elected, has systematically engaged in destroying every aspect of the legacy of Obama. Obama passes an accord with Iran, Trump destroys it. Obama signs the Paris Accord on climate change, Trump destroys it. Obama extends new protection of the environment, Trump destroys it. <laughs> Obama. So there is, there seems to be, apart from the difference in the political opinion, a very, very strong desire to make sure that I will not do anything of what this person has done. One other, ask, one other consequence of this way of looking at, it, at this, and I think this is very important relative to what has been a, not entirely recent, but maybe 10 or 15 years development in the social sciences, and it is that we cannot take the eight actors statement at face value. Certainly one of the major changes in anthropology, for example, but not only in many disciplines, has been the interest and the importance which is given to what agents have to say about what they're doing. And of course that is important. But in a way in which that then becomes taken as being the final statement about that, whatever it is that we are trying to understand or trying to discover. Mimetic theory has a point of view that, well, we should be a little bit distant as far as that goes, because what agents have to say about whatever concern them is primarily, there is no absolute, and not only there is no 
reason to believe that they have the truth about it, but there are many reasons to believe that they do not have the truth. That they do not necessarily know better simply because it happens to them. And that is a very important methodological point, I think. At first, uh, at first sight, there seems to be a contradiction between these two ideas. How can we say that agents lie to themselves if, as I argued before, they are not necessarily aware of what is going on. Their answer is that if at first agents are not aware of the rivalry, as the, as the rivalry becomes more and more intense, what is going on will become evident to everybody, including to them. But they will become less and less inclined to recognize it, and what follows is a strange mixture of misunderstanding and willful of misunderstanding, which Girard calls meconnaissance, or which in English we translate by misrecognition, which actually is a... <coughs> I don't know if we can translate in English misrecognition, for reasons related to the language, and also to the history of the concept of knowledge, meconnaissance in English. We can talk about that later. So the third point, uh, which is important, is that as the third point which the third consequence of the invitation of desire, which I think is important, is that as a rebellion and conflict caused by the imitation identified, uh, uh, the, uh, the imitation of desire intensifies, the rivals tend to lose sight, this is the very important, tend to lose sight of the object that originally motivated their opposition. This phenomenon is very evident in physical fights, physical conflict between agents, where the opponents rapidly lose sight of the object that was the original cause of their conflict to concentrate their energy on each other. This is just the structure of physical violence. In other words, what at first seems to be a rational conflict, whose goal was to win something, progressively tends to become an irrational whose goal is simply to win at any price. When the goal becomes to win at any price, then you clearly have lost sight of the object itself that was behind it. <clears throat> to me, one of the best contemporary examples of this, of such an escalation of violence, is the Syrian civil war. 500,000 civilian deaths. Five million a little bit over five, well, close to six million refugees, internationally refugees, and close to six million, a little bit over six million internally displaced persons, which means internal refugees, out of a population of 18 million. And that makes two thirds of the population. So what is left of Syria? Which was the price of this conflict? It's not evident at all that Whatever, whoever wins will win an extremely impoverished country by this conflict, which will take 50 years maybe to rebuild to where it was. So there you have a very good example, I think, illustration of the fact that the conflict, in a sense, really will say, destroys differences between the people. And what are differences? These differences correspond to objects in the real world and they become destroyed as a conflict. So, one, uh, one last thing, because uh, I have to talk about three different ideas. Uh, Girard will make a distinction which is very important in, within mimetic or triangular relationship, or, tri or mimetic desire and triangular relationship. It is the distinction between internal and external mediation. So, <clears throat> if I imitate, he takes the example of the novel Don Quixote, in which Don Quixote decides to go out and to imitate a fictional character, which is Amadis de Gaulle, who is a, a knight which goes around and fights complex here and there. So, this, says Girard, is external mediation. 
He imitates the desire of Amadis de Gaulle to be the most famous knight, one room knight. But it is external mediation because there is no opportunity, no possibility ever that Don Quixote will meet Amadis de Gaulle and they will be in conflict with each other. Even though they're in, they're, they are in conflict in a sense for the same object, they can never be directly Internal mediation arises when, he says, the circle, the ontological circle, so to speak, of the mediator and the model, the, I mean the subject and the mediator, become interpenetrate so that you can become the rival of the person or of who indicates to you what to desire. And when that happens, the conflicts will tend to become more violent and a lot more destructive. The idea, therefore, is that there is a difference between what he calls external mediation, where, in a sense, the mediator is transcendent because he does not enter into your universe in the way in which you can actually interact with him and rivalize with him directly. Though, of course, you are rival with him for something else, but is just a figure out there. And that is a major difference, right? And, um, yes, one, la one last thing is, well, no, I won't say that. So, so much for triangular desire. So triangular desire will become, nay, mimetic <coughs> desire much later. At this point, Girard doesn't talk about it. It doesn't use the adjective mimetic which is an adjective. Uh, he talks about imita imitated desire, and he talks about triangular desire. So the second book, Violence and the Sacred. So, Violence and the S so the first book was published in 1961. The, se the second one is in 1972, which is 11 years later. A long time has gone by. And while the first book was a book on literary theory, and was presented and received as, as such, the second book, talks about something completely different. Um, this book, uh, Manson Jean uh, Violence and the Sacred, is an essay on violence and its cultural role, which focuses, this essay is, focuses on ancient literature and religion, especially Greek, and on ethnographic material concerning myth, ritual, and religion, which come mostly from African and South American societies that have no centralized political system. So that's pretty much the basis for it. The underlying hypothesis that modulates this approach is that there is something similar in all these different societies, ancient Greece and non-centralized societies in Africa and South America, that and these societies are very distant in space, in time, and in social organization. So there is something very um, surprising, and it goes against the grain of what most anthropologists and historians and other social scientists believe, um, that actually we can treat of such different objects with a kind of unified approach. That's the main thing. And that's one of the things which will create the difficulty of, receive, of receiving this zero. And in a way, doing that is very provocative. In really, and was viewed by that, by the academy. People thought, what is this book? What is this person talking about? So, what is similar between all these societies, according to Girard? According to Girard, what is similar is that they have to deal with the problem of violence in a way that modern society characterized by a unified judicial system sustained by the state's monopoly of legitimate violence do not have to. The existence of such a system that is a centralized judicial system supported by the monopoly of legitimate violence changes everything according to Girard because it provides the final act of vengeance. To understand many ritual and prohibition found in many societies, argues Zira, 
It is important to realize that in those societies, violence, and especially internal violence, presents its a danger which it does not, or at least does not seem to, in our modern societies. <coughs> that danger is the, con is the contagion and the escalation of violence, which once we see them as part of a mechanism of protection against the danger of internal violence. Furthermore, we will see that many of these practices are closely related to the institution of sacrifice. So that's the other central point. These institutions are closely related to the institution of sacrifice. However, as many myths and literary texts suggest, this danger of generalized violence cannot always be avoided. And when it is not avoided, this is what Girard calls the mimetic or sacrificial crisis. It is when violence becomes generalized, touches everyone and transforms in, in individuals into mimetic doubles of violence. In order to understand how this may happen, we need to understand something of the nature of violence. Mimetic desire, as we just saw, can easily lead to violent conflict. Violence, argues Girard, like desire, is mimetic. Not only because it is often the mimetic desire that leads to violence, but also mimetic of itself, and all the more mimetic that the adversaries are more like. To say that violence is mimetic is again something which is evident in physical violence. I mean, everybody is trying to do exactly the same thing, right? That there is, uh, when I say that the, the it is all the more mimetic that the parties are alike. It means that there is not too great an asymmetry between the parties. In such condition, it, violence becomes eminently contagious. And in violence, as in mimetic desire, Asians try to assert their difference from each other. And the more they do, the more they become similar. Like two opponents in a boxing match. They're doing exactly the same thing, trying to hurt and destroy each other. Comes the point. When this, when this contagion of violence becomes universal in such small societies and the society enters into crisis, everyone is the violent devil and enemy of, of everyone else and, of course, potentially of all. When this happens, society could destroy itself in an orgy of reciprocal violence unless something would come to save them. And this is where Girard proposes is central hypothesis. What may, so we have to, one thing is, uh, Girard will propose a mechanism of resolution of this type of conflict, but the, the point is not that this will necessarily happen all the time. Sometimes it doesn't work, and societies do destroy themselves. We may sometimes, uh, what may sometimes save societies in such a uh, situation is a self-regulating social mechanism of violence. This mechanism is self-regulating in two very important sense. One, because it does not require anything else than the continuation of the violence that now threatens the whole society. So the idea is that it is self-regulating self because it doesn't ask people to renounce the violence. The, it is true pursuing the violence that the system will work. Right? It is violence itself that will regulate violence. That's the claim. Second, because it does not rest on any conscious or unconscious choice to renounce violence by the agents who are now engaged in it. How does it work? How does this system work? Everyone, if we agree that everyone is the enemy of everyone and potentially the enemy of all, the problem could be solved if all became the enemy of only one. The distinctions of that, the destruction of that unlucky victim would bring back the peace in the community because everyone, every other, so to speak, would simultaneously exert his or her hatred and violence against the same person. This is related to the fact that violence has a tendency to find substitute by objects if it cannot, for whatever reason, be exerted against its external common 
uh, uh, target here, the common victim of all becomes uh, the substitute object for the violence of all. I mean, the idea that violence finds substitute, find substitute object is again something which kind of like sends back to everyday life. You see, you take the subway, well, okay, I don't know if there's a subway in Canada. Uh, you take the subway, and uh, as uh, there's a vending machine, and somebody puts money in it, and um, nothing comes out. And then, then that person starts hitting this machine, punching it, and kicking it, and shouting at it. Well, you think probably, probably, the machine is not the real object of the violence of this person. It could be that he had a certain bad day at work, right? Or something else in his life made him really upset. The idea is that it is a normal thing. Violence has this ability, so to speak, or this tendency to find substitute object, to find, to satisfy itself in a sense of substitute, in a sense of substitute object. And here the idea is precisely this. It's precisely that we can, a community can move its violence, so to speak, all against the same object, and then that would be that would bring about reconciliation. Now, one of the characteristics of this hypothesis is that it cannot be observed directly. And this is not only because uh, we assume that this happened a long time in the past, but because nobody can report about it as it happened, in the way that it happened. And the reason why it is so is because agents are kind of like tricked by the system. They are brought to believe that the victim against which or against whom they all concentrate their violence is really guilty and really responsible for the violence. But that is not true. So they cannot report it as it happened directly because if they did, then it wouldn't work. Because then they would know that the designation of the victim is completely arbitrary and doesn't have anything to the violence as it is actually going on. So, to, or to explain this again in a different way, so why is it that they cannot report it directly? First, because it is a self-regulating mechanism of violence and that none of the participants understood how and why the violence came to an end. This incapacity is inscribed in the mechanism itself. It is only because all believe or are con convinced that the victim is the true cause of the violence, that the violence comes to an end. The participants do not realize that it is not because the victim was the true cause that the violence came to an end, but because they all believe that the victim was the true cause that the, the violence came to the end. That's the difference, right? So their incapacity to know the truth is a condition of the success of the mechanism. So nobody can give an exact empirical description of the event. The hypothesis cannot have any direct empirical confirmation. There is, however, indirect empirical evidence that we, we in, in the sense that we can find traces of this event. Therefore, before coming, uh, however, before coming to this evidence, one more needs to be said about this central hypothesis and the functioning of this mechanism. The victim says, Shirak will appear to the, its murderers as being all-powerful in creating violence. As a universal cause of the violence that recently visited the community, it will see all-powerful its ability to destroy it. But because the death of this victim put an end to the violence, the victim will also appear all-powerful in its ability to end the violence and save the community paradoxically, by its own death. And this thing, Sirar, is the origin of sacrifice, especially. In the terrible form of the mimetic crisis that threatens the community, and in the beneficial form of its self-regulating mechanism that saves us. Violence is the sacred, is the thesis of Sirar. And <coughs> This explanation of the sacred um, 
will be viewed as scandalous. And uh, it is, and Girard, actually, there's a story, I'm not sure what, how true the story, but there is an article that was published a short time after in the French newspaper Le Monde, which is one of the major French newspapers, which argued that this was the first atheist explanation of religion. And the reason why it's the first atheist explanation of religion is the following, or so, I, and I think it's, it's a pretty good one, it's a pretty good thing, a pretty good way of looking at it. Traditionally, religious science tried to explain the origin of religion by saying, well, you know, the human mind has this kind of capacity to imagine, you know, some transcendental power, and religion is a way of explaining that culturally. Or, and they see this in uh, the force of nature, and then they say, Jupiter is the god of thunder, and so on. But here, we don't make any hypothesis about religious tendency of the human spirit. We make an hypothesis about something completely different. We make an hypothesis about violence and its resolution. And out of this will emerge something which will satis which satisfies the what we know, one of the some of the things we know about the sacred is that the sacred originally always appeared as an all powerful force for both good and evil. And there we have something which generates this without having to make, to make any hypothesis about the religiosity of the human mind to start with. And that is why it is, it could be described as the first radically atheist theory of religion. Now, we can just move this a little bit and, uh, or repeat this in a slightly different manner. I think one of the interests of this explanation compared to the other one is that it explains religion by something which it is not. Most traditional theory which explain religion by the presence of some kind of religious disposition in the human mind, in ultimately, they explain religion by religion. They explain it by what it is. But a good scientific explanation doesn't explain something by what it is. It explains it as a resulting of something else. So here, this is what we have. We have an explanation which explains religion, not by the religious mind, but by something completely different, by the difficulty for societies to resolve the problem of internal violence. So we explain something by reference to something else, which is pretty much what we want in explanations. So what are the traces of this? Well, the traces of this, according to Girard, are myths, because there are many myths which tell a story, which can be seen as a metaphorical representation of the crisis of, the, of violence and its resolution. And these myths very often end by the death, in some way, destruction of the <coughs> mythical hero, <coughs> the founder of the community, and out of the death of this hero, cultural artifacts appear. They kind of like, this is when we discovered how to make certain things, how to agriculture, for example, and so on. So there's myth. The other aspect is prohibition and rituals. So the idea is that rituals tend to reproduce how the crisis came to an end. Well, we know how the crisis came to an end. It came to an end through gestures of violence. And they tend to reproduce, to prohibit, and prohibitions, rather, tend to prohibit the gestures that led to the crisis. But we know what type of gestures those were. There were gestures of violence also. So one of the consequences of this is that many times, what is prohibited and what is prescribed in a ritual will be the same thing. So that the 
ritual prescribes what is prohibited. And that <coughs> is actually something that we very frequently find in many traditional societies, where rituals prescribe what is radically prohibited in normal circumstances. And the interest of this for Girard is that, of course, well, he can explain that instead of simply saying, these people were confused, these people were not confused, these people had a very important goal they were trying to resolve, but they just did not know very well how it had happened, but they were trying to do it. So, the, one of the interesting, and that again is an interesting aspect of Girard's theory, even though, as I said earlier, we should not take what agents say at face value, at the same time, it allows us to discover meaning in things which at first sight may appear confused and without meaning. And that is another important aspect. One last thing. Girard says that this is the origin of culture. One of the things which is involved here and which is important is that the concept is concerns the concept of origin involved. Usually when we think of origin, we think of, there's only one origin, so to speak. We think of the origin as the starting point. I mean, that's our immediate concept of, of origin. But for Girard, the idea is that this mechanism was actually repeated many times in many different societies. So it is a how can I say, a recursive origin. It is not something which happened only once, out of which culture follows as one thing, but it is rather something which would have happened many times in many different societies and would have led to the evolution of society. And this shows, this <coughs> explains also why very different societies in time can, and space, can have somewhat similar institutions, <coughs> even though there has been no historical contact between them, because the origin of their institutions is the same, even though the same in the sense of recursive, right? Not in the same in the individual sense. And that's an important point. So finally, things hidden since the foundation of the world. Uh, this is the book which was, which is a book which provides a, an interpretation of Christianity. It was published in 1977, therefore five years, I said six, five years after, uh, this, after Violence and the Sacred. And it is the first formulation of the mimetic theory as such. As such. Actually the term mimetic happens pretty much in the, around the, the half, the second half of Violence and the Sacred. That's where you start, that's where you start to use it. It is, uh, it is a strange book because it is written in the form of a dialogue with two persons, which are Jean-Michel Gourmillan and Guy Lefort, who are two French psychiatrists, actually, who came to see him. And it is, the book is in three parts. And the first part argues and expands upon the findings of violence and the sacred. The second part is about Christianity, it is the most new in a sense. And the third part comes back to the theory of desire. So, at this point I will just focus on the second part. So, what Girard argues there is that Christ's passion reveals the functioning of this cell phone, of this self-regulating mechanism of violence which he presented in violence. And that in doing so, it makes this mechanism inefficient. And this is an important point. So not only does Christianity put an end to sacrifice, which historically we know is true, and in doing, um, but it also makes inefficient the mechanism that gave rise to sacrifice as an institution. And in a sense, that gave rise to all our institutions. <clears throat> so that Christianity will lead to a slow process of dissolution 
of institution inherited from the sacrificial mechanism. And it will bring about the collapse, the stop. It will take 2,000 years and it's not over. The solution of the world of the sacred and all and, the very, all and every institution founded on it will slowly collapse. Christian revelation, according to Girard, deprives us of all inherited means of protecting ourselves against violence. All means which until now constituted what we call culture and, according to Girard, it leaves us with a, a stark choice. Either reconcile ourselves peacefully without the help of violence mean, or totally destroy ourselves in a nuclear and ecological catastrophe. So, <clears throat> question, how does Christian revelation do that? <laughs> how does it bring this about, right? <laughs> how does it make violent, sacred, impotent, right? Unable to protect us anymore? Simply, according to Girard, by revealing the innocence of the, uh, and the arbitrary designation of the victim. That the victim is not the cause of the violence, but killed without reason. Because once people know that, the victim is innocent. The mechanism cannot work anymore. I argued that earlier before. So this, in a sense, will create in Girard's own work what can be seen as a kind of argument for the an epistemological argument for the existence of God. This knowledge, this knowledge of how the mechanism functions, argues Girard, cannot be of human origin because all of human culture is based on the fundamental misrecognition, misrecognition of the victim as guilty. So the origin of this knowledge must be transcendent in its origin this time. It must come from a source that is beyond and above human knowledge and culture. That source is given to us as the sacred text of the Gospel. The Gospel, and especially the page, the Passion of Christ, argues your eyes, are the revelation of the God, of a God that does not have anything to do with the violent gods of the sacred. That's the thing. A God that is defined by love rather than violence. So besides the theological implication of this interpretation, about which I'm not competent to really say anything, there are at least three other important consequences. One concerns the reinterpretation of, scripture, of scriptures or of the Bible as a whole. Or if you prefer, of sacred history. Central is the idea that this revelation, the revelation of the innocence of the victim, is progressive, that it does not happen brutally, and that God slowly reveals himself as non-violent, little by little, and that the passion is the culmination of this history, of a religion that is characterized as was noted by both Nietzsche and Max Weber by the fact that it takes the side of the victim. The second point concerns historical Christianity. In things hidden, Girard has a very severe judgment on historical Christianity, which means actually a church, if you prefer. Given that he views that the central message of Christ is, is which is of non-violence, and the historical record of Christianity, his conclusion is that Christianity has failed. And to an important extent that it has falsified the message that it was given to promote. Historical Christianity remained a violent religion and function as a violent mechanism of protection against violence. Yet, according to him, in spite of this failure, the historical effects of this revelation continues. And the third point concerns what may be defined as the historical status of Western civilization and of the modern world. And I will, cut, I will present this in three points. First, the first consequence of this, contrary to what may be expected, a culture marked or disrupted by the nonviolent revelation will tend to be more rather than less violent. More violent because this revelation destroys or renders inefficient the cultural mechanism that protects it against its own violence. So Western culture 
would be more violent as a consequence of that, not less. And this dissolution of the dissolution of the mechanism of protection against violence is what explained what has often been described as the dynamism, dynamism of the Western world and its violence in extending its power across the whole planet. Second, given the effect of this revelation, the Western world can be described as a kind of anti-culture. A culture that destroyed cultures. Modernity destroyed traditional cultures in the West, and the exportation of this culture to colonialism and now globalism destroys traditional cultures everywhere in the world. It leads to a form of worldwide homogenization of non-culture, so that Western culture can be defined as the culture of the end of culture. So that when, uh, just like Marcel Gaucher describes Christianity as the religion of the end of religion. Third, finally, is the apocalyptic dimension of Girard's thought. Given all of the above, the globalization of Western civilization and value is seen by him, in a sense, as a sign of the end of the world. So three main ideas that hold together in a sense, in the sense that they make a coherent system, though through the last one. Because Christian revelation constitute what it what initiates the last moment of the world history, and also because Christian revelation is what allows us to read ancient myths as you are, reads them as traces of past violence rather than as expression of some mythological dimension of the human, mythical dimension of the human psyche or some obscure religious premonition. Right. So, I'd be happy to discuss. <laughs>
mi sembra che in una forma eh, estremamente raffinata ripeta però un atteggiamento che è per dirla con Strauss eh, di Gerusalemme e non di Atene richieda l'obbedienza e non la libera ricerca l'obbedienza è Gerusalemme mm -hmm. la libera ricerca è Atene è un po' come se Girard porti all'estremo il razionalismo occidentale per mostrarne il carattere profondamente cristiano e dunque religioso e quindi non mi torna la che la spiegazione della religione di Girard è di tipo ateista Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> the other microphone. Uh, they will go, well, maybe not. I'll take this one. I got it. Uh, actually, um, there, there's more than one answer. <laughs> one answer is that um, to say that this explanation of religion is atheist or atheistic was publicity. What I mean by this, there's a story, I nearly said, and I held myself back, which, it was in a big article on violence of the secular, a short time after it came out, and this article was published in Le Monde, the first newspaper in France, really, well, at least in a certain way. It was signed by Jean-Jubert de Ratkowski. Jean-Jubert de Ratkowski was actually, you know, as his name suggests, of Polish origin, and he was, um, director of a collection in the French editor Plon, where Girard published a book on Dostoevsky. But the legend has it that this article was not written by Jean-Jacques Velazkowski. The legend has it that it was signed by him, but it was actually written by René Girard himself. Now, whether that is true or not, I do not know. But I know that it is a legend, because I never asked him, and I don't know what he would have answered, and even if he would have answered truly. <laughs> so, that, so one, uh, one possibility, or one way of putting it, that is truly atheistic theory of religion, is in a sense publicity. What I mean by this is to mark a difference, right? a very strong difference. The other answer, which goes closer to your analysis, is the following. Girard was a very religious man, and, and a Christian, there's no problem about that, right? And there is a tradition in which Christianity is a religion, en français, we say, qui ne fait pas non avec les autres religions, which is radically different from all other religions. To claim that it is an, an atheistic, that his explanation of religion was an atheistic explanation of religion, is a way of saying exactly that. In other words, all these other religions can be explained in purely rational scientific terms, but not Christianity. So that is, a, I think, that is a possible way of, I think that's probably the best way of understanding his position. Right? That's what it means. That's really what it means. I think that's the way we have to see it. But of course this creates the problem, this creates the problem that, or the issue that if you're not religious Christian, if you're an atheist, for example, then you have the problem of, so why does he make this exception? How do I deal with this exception? How do we take care of this, this I mean the exception being Christianity, right? How, how do we deal, how do we, can we put all of these together? That's one problem. The other problem it creates is a different problem, which may be viewed as a problem of um, uh, ecclesiastical policy. What I mean by this is uh, there, there is a tendency of, um, since the Vatican II uh, Council, the, of the idea of, you know, a prior creating a continuity between Christianity and other religions, but opening up. And this seems to be bringing us, or could be read as bringing us back to, a, as bring the politics of Catholicism back to a very traditional point of view where there is no relationship between us and others, right? 
or between Christians and others. But uh, actually, if you look at the evolution of the Rene's, I mean, it's in 1977, right? And, they the, and how, how this evolves to uh, until he dies, and you know, other people who are interested in it, we see something quite different, where actually what we see is to the opposite, an opening, and trying to see ways, of people arguing that in many, many religions, there are kind of like partial revelations of the mechanism. So, but anyway, it's, it's a very interesting question because it, it is a question which has many different aspects and opens up on many different issues. <coughs> di fare la stessa cosa così okay. ci riprendiamo uh, there's a famous book which you probably know which is considered by some anthropologists the answer to violence and the same and the book is Masse und Macht Massa e Potere by Elias Canetti which was written a long time before. Um, yes, but it was in a sense used uh, used against him. Or um, there's an interpretation which goes uh, uh, as to consider mass and not the viewpoint of the scapegoat. So the viewpoint of the scapegoat means that in principle we have a mass or a mass society which accept violence, because this is the problem. I mean, violence is not a taboo as it's presented in the modern state. Because um, what you said, I mean, it's extremely interesting to see an antagonism between the modern state, uh, which, in a sense, wants to monopoly, wants to monopolize power, and the taboo of violence, on the other hand. I mean, we guarantee you, but at the same time, guarantee we, we guarantee that you won't be touched. It's obvious corpus in a sense of the individual, of the citizen. And this is the taboo which has to be broken for religious reasons. In both cases. I mean, in Kanetti you have the viewpoint of the scapegoat, but you accept the principles. And in Gerard you accept the principles. A certain, uh, a certain amount of violence uh, is necessary for the survival of the community. This is not recognized by the secular modern state, no. at but least in the constitution. I mean, in the facade, I'm not saying that it does not exist. I mean, we see violence performed every day, but uh, I'm talking about principle of the state. I'm talking about the state as it presents itself in its constitution. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's been a long time since I read Marco uh, Marco Canetti, so. It's going to be hard to respond to that precisely, um, except to say that uh, Rene quotes <laughs> Mass and Mark in Violence of the Sacred, actually. So, but the, um, well, what is central in, um, in, in uh, I was not clear about that, one of the aspects is central in, in the mechanism and in the creation of the sacred is that it creates or it establishes a division between good and bad violence. In other words, between violence which is acceptable, violence which not only can be recommended, <coughs> and violence which is unacceptable. And of course the modern state does exactly the same thing. It is called the monopoly of legitimate violence, which makes the distinction between legitimate violence which is exerted by the state, and illegitimate violence, which is exerted by la mafia, individual citizens, and so on. And the state also prescribes legitimate violence in the case of warfare. This is what war is about. You are obliged to kill other people. It becomes your duty. This is legitimate violence. And this violence is prescribed as necessary and offered as necessary to the survival or success of the community. So the, the, the fact that the main difference is where does this, 
slip go? Where does it pass, so to speak, right? And the, the fact that the modern state claims this monopoly, then the modern state says that like, it passes only one place, so to speak, right? While traditional society make this difference pass everywhere, because there's no monopoly. And one of the, one of the, um, we, we, like, I mean, I don't know exactly how it is in Italy, but in North America and, uh, I don't know, in France and in England, one of the big issues, it, it concerns what are being called uh, crimes of honor, where parents kill their daughter because she decides to marry a Christian or some guy who belongs to a group he should not belong to, right? Now, to us, this is a crime. But in the traditional culture they come with, this is an obligation of violence. This is not a crime, this is an obligation of violence. The, the line where the difference between legitimate and illegitimate violence is, doesn't go to the same types of behavior. So, the, of course, this is not to say this right, this is a completely different issue, but I think this is really important to see this difference in terms of what is legitimate and what isn't legitimate. And different societies make this go through somewhere else. And you can think that, you can, I mean, I'll talk about that and I'll talk about political violence, but what is terrorism? Terrorism is moving the line between legitimate and illegitimate violence. It is to say, it is legitimate to kill these people because they are X. Period. And the great, <laughs> I would say, trap of um, terrorism is when the state responds by thinking, oh, then it is legitimate to <laughs> repress them. And then, of course, it itself participate in the movement of making the line somewhere else than when it should be, right? So, the line in our societies, in our modern societies, is essentially between the inside and the outside of the territory. Inside the territories are friends. Outside the territories are enemies, or at least potential enemies. What does a terrorist, terrorism group? It brings back this distinction inside the territory by saying this group is can be the object of legitimate violence. And political violence is always a discussion concerning what is legitimate and what is not legitimate violence. So I think it is a very important issue that you raised, which is the issue of how communities, but you know, communities always, there's always violence. And in a sense, when Girard says that Christianity tends to bring a society which is more violent, it is precisely because it is a community which becomes less and less able to harness violence against violence. That's the point.
il senso del religioso può emergere quando davvero non c'è nessuna trascendenza, quando davvero Dio là fuori non, non c'è. E questo è il contenuto epistemico che è elevante, non è affatto, è nella, nelle cose nascoste. Questo è un equivoco secondo me. Lui non, non, non sembra, almeno a me sembra possibile aderire a una interpretazione atea della cosa. Poi lui dice in altri punti una cosa, ma lo dice in modo molto sibillino, quasi non lo dice in modo eh, aperto. Dice bene, a un certo punto c'era questo signore che camminava qua in Palestina, in Galilea, duemila anni fa. E l'ha capito, vogliamo che lui abbia... Diciamo, si è reso conto del meccanismo mimetico, delle crisi, eccetera, eccetera. Quasi aredotalmente, potremmo dire, si è posto il problema, bene, qual è il modo migliore per raccontarlo alla gente che vi sta intorno? E è andato in giro a parlare per parabole, per, come dire, se fosse andato oggi avrebbe raccontato scrivendo paper per seguire, eccetera, eccetera. Non c'è scienza, tu sei, tu sei da, sì, avrebbe fatto, sarebbe stato un influencer, sarebbe stato un youtuber, forse, non lo so. Tu sei in Galilea, tu mi l'hai fatto e hai questa, questo, questa gnosis e come la racconti alla mente? giochi un po' sul Vecchio Testamento cerchi di dire parabole però voglio avere e, e qual è la rivelazione che lui dice? perché Girard dice a un certo punto e questo è il suo elemento non potrebbe essere un caso lui sostanzialmente dice non potrebbe essere stato un caso è una singolarità tale che per me Girard questo è segno della trascendenza ma io non necessariamente noi non siamo siamo obbligati a aderirne e io ne aderisco nel senso come dire, che posso vederne l'emergenza anche in modo quasi stocastico come un fenomeno e magari come lui altri hanno potuto avere questa gnosi è una coincidenza storica per cui i Vangeli hanno avuto successo che hanno avuto eccetera eccetera la cosa interessante in che cosa consiste la rivelazione e perché lui doveva essere figlio di Dio in un certo senso perché quelli che uccidono la vittima, quelli che sono catturati nella violenza reciproca e si sfogano sulla vittima unica, sul capo espiatorio, sono convinti della colpevolezza. Lui è supremamente innocente, come può figlio di Dio essere colpevole di alcun che? Doveva dire ad altri e doveva essere palesato, e si palesa attraverso il testo evangelico, e tutti i testi evangelici, a differenza dei miti, delle mitologie di Cigirà, ci dice una cosa, era innocente. Capire che nel capo respiratore è innocente, cioè, da un certo punto, da quel momento in poi, non possiamo più fare questo gioco del capo respiratorio perché ogni volta ho un po' di sospetto che sto facendo un capo respiratorio e che se sono sospetto che quello lì è innocente, che noi ci siamo in realtà tra di noi, scatenando contro una vittima. E questo è il bullismo nelle scuole, questo è il bullismo tutto, certo dire, mia figlia è bullizzata o fa parte di quelli che bullizzano qualcun altro. Se hai sospetto che in fondo è un meccanismo per unirci tra di noi, per creare un bond, per creare relazioni sociali, per fondamentalmente ripacificarci tra di noi, se hai questo sospetto, tendi a non... Quel meccanismo non ha più la sua propria efficacia, questo è l'elemento. E un'altra cosa, quella che hai detto, o aderisce a tutto o non aderisce a niente, è, è è il motivo per cui io ho voluto in particolare a tutti i girardiani avere qua produce, perché vedremo nelle altre recensioni. Paul, a mio avviso, è uno dei, quelli, dei cosiddetti girardiani, ma forse è un tributo improprio, ne ha fatto un uso più euristico, come se fosse una euristica. Per cui non è detto che ogni comunità che lacerate le vittime interne può necessariamente finire in campo espiatorio, magari può trovare una vittima esterna, il processo può non andare su più un compimento. È come dire un paio di occhiali che ti fanno vedere il meccanismo del desiderio mimetico, che crea l'idea che io desidero quello che tu desideri, diventiamo da amici, da supremi, diventiamo rivali e poi di la violenza si scrittura da voi, come questo processo a livello di micro, micro gruppi individuali può crescere e crescere e crescere e conteggiare un'intera comunità e quindi quello che lui chiama per crisi sacrificata e poi rifinire sotto forma del capo espiatorio eccetera eccetera come queste formule non si risolvono sempre così che possono esserci moltissime evoluzioni è come se tu hai come dire, la formula della relazione 
newtoniana delle forze, masse, e poi però con questo, con questo modello precisamente puoi generare molte forme che vediamo anche oggi. Il testo di cui lui parla, di cui presenterà De Mouchel il giorno 7 sulla violenza politica precisamente usa questa gnosis, questa diciamo, visione per raccontarci della, de, de, della violenza e della non violenza odierna, dove il meccanismo non c'è, società sono più complesse, non siamo, non siamo più contenuta, co, 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 comunità contenute, isolate, che devono al loro interno risolvere la violenza, potrebbe essere più facile prendere come qualcuno contro cui unici sotto forma di nemico, razzo, eccetera, eccetera, e quindi come questi tre piccoli meccanismi in realtà, pur essendo interamente razionalmente ripercorribili, non c'è nessuna ipotesi trascendentale necessaria, però nonostante questo raccontano, danno conto di come potrebbe essere emersa dentro ciascuno una idea di trascendenza, come dire, sotto forma quasi di misconoscimento, sono in grado di generare forme, generare strutture, organizzazioni, cultura e per chiuderla diciamo la cosa, in particolare quello che ci interessa bene, e quando oggetto di questa rivalità tra di noi diventa uno spazio, diventa paesaggio, diventano piazze, diventano luoghi, perché non possiamo anche nel loro modo in cui loro si costruiscono, progettano, formano le forme che assumono, trovare, scoprire un meccanismo girardiano che ne dà conto in maniera più efficiente delle altre teorie che ci raccontano della produzione dello spazio. Non so se ci sono altre riflessioni. Proviamo, sentiamo un po' il dottor Andi. No, 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 tutto what you said. Tutto what you said. Yes, tutto bene. Ah, sì, va bene. Io no. Indeciso se fare questa domanda o meno per due motivi. Il primo perché non è una domanda, non è una riflessione che io vorrei uh, condividere con, uh, con voi. La seconda cosa è perché uh, so che ci sarà un'altra data, uh, la quale io non potrò presenziare, in cui si parlerà marcatamente di produzione spaziale e di teoria giardiana. Uh, la questione è questa. Uh, io sono un architetto, sono un dottorante, faccio un dottorato in composizione architettonica urbana. E quello che mi interessa è chiaramente eh, l'approccio che Girard eh, o i girardiani hanno eh, eh, rivolto alla produzione architettonica. So che esiste eh, un libro, dove è scritto anche il Girard, Girard, che è Leon Crier, eh, che si chiama Architects and Mimetic Rivalry. Mm -hmm. eh, eh, però purtroppo non ho letto. Eh. Leggerò, lo leggerò nel più breve tempo possibile. Più breve, eh, tempo possibile. La questione è, è questa. Uh, sostanzialmente io vorrei porre una riflessione in una chiave che è quella che mi appartiene perché fa parte della mia ricerca di dottorato, che è quella della partecipazione alla produzione architettonica. Uh, e uh, in, questo, uh, in questa, questo contesto uh, le prime uh, pagine di uh, menzogna romantica e verità romantica mi hanno fortemente eh, condizionato eh, perché hanno, mi hanno, hanno fatto emergere la, uh, la, la, la figura del, del mediatore e quindi in questa uh, dinamica triangolare uh, in cui uh, il, uh, il soggetto è chiaramente chi usa l'architettura, i cittadini, i utenti, l'oggetto è la produzione architettonica e l'architetto si fa mediatore. Si fa mediatore perché uh, convoglia, definisce e convoglia, quindi uh, uh, produce il desiderio, nel senso che uh, i cittadini fondamentalmente sono chi usa l'architettura, fondamentalmente è, uh, oh, questa è una mia uh, come dire, interpretazione chiaramente seminale, se così vogliamo, che uh, appunto io le, um, come dire, le, le propongo anche perché visto che ho la possibilità di interagire con lei nei prossimi giorni, se sarà possibile come dire, ulteriormente approfondire questa cosa. Quindi se l'architetto eh, produce desiderio perché eh, definisce le modalità in cui l'architettura deve essere prodotta, intorno agli anni 60 è emersa una uh, corrente di pensiero, di cui un importante architetto italiano come Giancarlo Riccardo si fa a portavoce, 
che dice che l'architettura è troppo importante per essere lasciata agli architetti e quindi eh, in qualche modo mette in discussione la figura del, del mediatore così come io l'ho eh, considerata vero è che anche in questo caso nel momento in cui si costruisce un processo ben, eh, nel quale anche i cittadini possono prendere parte alle trasformazioni che siano legate alla, quindi alla dimensione più eh, eh, elementare dell'architettura che sia la casa, la residenza ma anche le trasformazioni urbane l'architetto in questo caso comunque non perde se vogliamo la funzione di mediatore perché comunque in maniera diversa tende a veicolare comunque il processo, il processo uh, uh, architettico. Uh, la questione è questa, uh, il mio crucio sostanziale in questa, questa tesi, o uno dei miei crucio, è quello di capire in che modo oggi la, la partecipazione all'architettura possa essere, possa essere condotta, perché l'architettura, eh, perché la partecipazione è diventata negli ultimi decenni qualcosa di... Uh, 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 sovrautilizzato e quindi ha perso la sua, la sua, la sua importanza eh, la, eh, e quindi come dire, penso che le, le, le letture future di Gira in qualche modo possano definire questa dimensione euristica della, perché, mi, se, perché eh, mi rendo conto che, che, che eh, potrebbe essermi utile per fare luce sulle cose eh, la, la, la terza riflessione sempre sulla dimensione eh, appunto partecipativa è quella che se si eh, perde la figura del mediatore perché l'architettura la, 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 perde eh, quella figura o quella figura si fa meno perde la sua essenza è chiaro che anche in questo caso c'è una idiosincrasia di fondo perché i cittadini non possono pensare di essere architetti e quindi in, questa, in qualche modo Può darsi che, secondo la teoria girardiana, la triangolazione della partecipazione sia necessaria e sia una condizione dalla quale non si può prescindere. E questa insomma, è la, la riflessione che io volevo proporle eh, <ride> <ride> e volevo proporre a tutti voi. Grazie. 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 In a way, uh, the, I think the, the position, historically the position of the architect has changed as being the mediator between, well, in a sense, the, what has changed also is the transcendence. Because if you look at great architect, architectural monuments of the 19th century or earlier, the architect is really the representative of a transcendent power. But this has disappeared. But then he was the representative of a transcendent knowledge, <laughs> so to speak. But this has also disappeared, <laughs> or is in the process of disappearing. And then he becomes somebody who must be listening to the public. And then, of course, what happens there is that what we see is this the transcendent, so to speak, is coming in. And this, of course, if we look at this from a Girardian point of view, we are in a situation where we have met the possibility of conflicts and of disagreements because precisely this transcendent power having, or this transcendent reference having disappeared, then it becomes a relationship of double. And of rivals. So then the question is, but you see, in this, in, in, in what I'm answering to you, in a way, I am overlooking <laughs> the product itself because I'm talking about the relationship between the architect and the public. And in a way, the product is precisely what can be transcendent. Whether, I mean, I don't have any particular insight as to what would work and what would not work, right? But it seems to me that it, it, it is interesting to analyze how this relationship has changed. Because I think, to me, at first sight, 
uh, it is the, the kind of disappearance of, you know, this, so to speak, triangle where we have the architect, the object, and the public, was always, or until recently, framed within a, a bigger framework where there was a transcendent power, of which both the architect and the object were, in a sense, the consequence or the expression. And it seems to me that this, the taking away that, right? Because historically this is what we've, we've seen, what we have is a different type of relationship, right? And which is more a relationship of rivalry here between the architect and the public for the object, right? Which is the city, which is the space, which is the whatever, right? Now, then the question is how we resolve that. As I said, I don't have any particular insight on how to do this. <laughs> If that was useful. Ci sono altri interventi? Altre domande? Commenti? Allora, anche per questo pubblico si è sfoltito. Niente, solo a invitarvi alle prossime puntate allora a questo punto. Lunedì abbiamo il collega Pala, che è quello che è intervenuto che alle 4 di pomeriggio ci parla dei paesaggi letterari, quindi torniamo a parlare dell'oggetto del paesaggio, come stamattina il Marcello eh, Tacca e come rispecchiamenti di costruzioni che questo paesaggio diciamo, emerge, viene costruito, ci si rispecchia, bla bla bla, attraverso nella letteratura. Eh? Nella letteratura, sì. E poi abbiamo mh, martedì 7, la mattina siamo al Dipartimento di Giurisprudenza con colleghi De Muro e Ruggiu su desideri e paura dell'altro, sfide giudiziarie del multiculturalismo e pomeriggio, sempre giurisprudenza, a lezione di Paul su Mouchel, sulla violenza, sulla violenza della scarsità e violenza politica. L'otto invece siamo la cosa spaziale, quella che Andrea purtroppo si perderà. Eh, la cosa spaziale, nel senso che la mattina c'è il corpo a corpo la città, Maurizio Memoli, eh, Alice Salimbeni e la collega Francesca Governo del Politecnico di Torino eh, e noi dove parleremo, dove il focus sarà esattamente questa cosa, no, poi c'è pomeriggio c'è eh, Peligra, eh, l'economia, dall'intervenza alla intersoggettività e economia e poi la cosa interessante è questo, che la giornata del 9 ci torneremo se vi porto sulla teoria mimetica a parlarne delle, dei suoi contenuti epistemici, cioè epistemologici, statuto epistemologico, in, quanto, in che senso questa è una teoria scientifica, qual è il suo statuto, come si diciamo, e il pomeriggio l'ipotesi di una produzione dello spazio. Quindi vedere come questa teoria o questa ipotesi possa essere fertile anche Andrea per cose che e molte delle riflessioni che tu hai fatto sono contenute in qualche scritto, che qualche, qualche cosa che co condivideremo e che secondo me può essere così fecondo per continuare a dibattere. E poi, eh, 10 maggio, vivere con i robot. Mi sembra una cosa eh, settimana piena. Buon fine settimana, vi ringrazio.